because this is the toughest issue that we deal with as followers of Jesus, I think. And, and as, we, as, as we face other people in the world. Because after we start talking about, yes, there is a God who exists, and yes, there is a Jesus who exists, it always gets down to, oh yeah? Well, tell me this. And it goes on to, how come Hitler? Or how come Pol Pot? Or how come Hiroshima? Or how come uh, people are starving in the world? And how come this and how come that? And they, there is almost this question as if there can be a God. Now, if you pull out your, your uh, sermon cards for today, what you'll see is there's going to be a little bit of fill out uh, in the notes. There's a lot of scripture verses, and that's because there is no way that I can cover the whole thing in one sermon. This is, this is a month-long worth of sermons, uh, and, and we're just going to scratch it, but it'll give you some things to think about and, and a way to start handling this in your own life. You see, when people come up and they say that, that there can't be a God because of pain and suffering, or I don't understand because, or I can't believe in a God who allows this because of pain and suffering. They're basically coming at the, the world through one of, two, one of two viewpoints. The, the, the first one is, of the three classic answers, God is good, you can write in the word good, God is good and his intentions are good, but he's powerless to end pain and suffering. So he's good, but he's powerless. And that would mean it's, it's kind of like the deists who say God got the whole thing going. It's like a big clock, but just like a clock, sometimes things break down and he's unable to fix it once he got, got it going or he, he, doesn't, he, he just doesn't get involved in the world in that way anymore. And so he's powerless. But we know that if God's powerless to do that, then he's not really God. So you start off by saying, yes, there is a God, and that can't be the answer because, because God is all-powerful, because otherwise he wouldn't be what Scripture says he is and what our experience in the world is. So the second idea is, well, God is powerful, but he is not good, that he could stop pain and suffering, but won't because in general he's kind of evil and he enjoys watching us suffer. And, and you'll hear people who will talk about God, you know, he's kind of moving me around as a puppet. Or, or remember that in, in Forrest Gump, uh, Lieutenant Dan, you know, who is, who is struggling with his life and who he is and where he fits in after he's lost his legs in Vietnam. And he's out there, they're out in the, in the uh, storm and he's yelling at God, is that all you, God? Aren't you going to do anything worse to me? You know, I'm still here. And, and so, so battling that, saying that God's powerful, but he's evil, and he does bad things to people. Well, a lot of folks will think that way, and they say, I can't believe in a God who, and then you fill in the blank, whatever, whatever that is. But, but there is a third way of thinking about this, and, and it comes from uh, both of our scripture lessons. Uh, one of them is, is uh, in Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to be like his son. Now think about that. He chose them to be like his son. A son who, who left his throne on high did not count equality with God something to be grabbed onto, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. And being found in human form, it says in the book of Philippians, that he humbled himself. He humbled himself to death, even death on the cross. It says God works everything for our own good so we can become more and more like his son. Well, what did Jesus experience in life? Did he experience hunger? Did he experience pain and injustice at the hands of others? Did he experience abandonment? Did he experience 
the loss of his dad, his family forsaking him. It says when he came to a friend, Lazarus, who, who died, the shortest verse in Scripture comes from the Gospel of John. Jesus wept. It's just one, in, in Greek, it's just one word. He wept. So Jesus is feeling, experiencing all these things. Now we got to figure out how we are going to be like his son. And then in the gospel lesson where it says that this man was born blind, and they, the, his disciples are saying, well, why, why is this guy born blind? Is it because he sinned or his parents sinned? Like there's punishment in the world. Like there's a God who says, oh, you do that? I'm going to do this to you. And Jesus' answer was, this man was born blind so that God's glory might be shown. How'd you like that for a calling? Born without sight for 30 years, say, so that in one fell swoop, Jesus could take a little ground, spit in it, rub it in his eyes, and he's healed. Just like Jesus, when Adam was created out of the earth and the Holy Spirit breathed life into it, he takes that same earth and brings life to some eyes. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm not sure I'd want that as my calling. But I know that it says all things work for good to them that love God are called according to his purposes. And that he shows us, he wants us to be like Jesus. And so maybe, maybe in all the way we think about things, he's asking us to be like Jesus. Let's go to that point number three, C. People writing the Old and New Testaments had another answer. God is at the same time, time infinitely good and all-powerful. He is able to act and finds no pleasure in our suffering. So he did something about it that would end our suffering forever. And what did he do? Let's read it. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. That in the end, God allowed, in, in, in fact, his, his permissive will, his directing will and his permissive will, allowed Jesus to come under all of the pangs and struggles of this life that it can afford in order for us to be forever with the Lord. And, and, and that our, our momentary loss and struggles that we have here, if we're going to think like Jesus. Remember when, when, when he said, oh, Father, if there's any way that, that this suffering can pass, this can pass from me, I want this cup to pass from me, but, but not my will, thy will be done. And then he willingly went to the cross. At any moment, the guy who walked on water, the guy who healed the sick, the, the, the guy who calmed the storm, don't you think he could have come off of that cross? And yet he held back his power at that time for the sake of love. And if we're going to be like him, we have to understand sometimes things happen in our lives for the sake of love. Think about this because in dealing with the first two, we're thinking about the permissive and, the, and the, the directing will of God. Which is the will of God? The fall of man, was that the will of God? Well, yeah, he allowed it because he didn't make Adam and Eve into robots. He didn't make the angels robots. They could choose to love him or not love him. And he gave them the possibility of falling. What about the crucifixion? Was that the will of God? 
How about your recent car accident? Or, or the loss of your significant other? Is that the will of God? See, we've got to figure all these things out. And in some wise, we need to suspend ourselves. And in other wise, we need to propel ourselves, suspend our unbelief and propel ourselves into faith. So there is a positive will of God, which is always good, second page now, never evil, and leads those who do it along the path to righteousness, fulfillment, and joy. By this will and power, he creates and sustains the, the, the uh, good in our world. For instance, uh, Matthew 22, Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Is that the will of God? Thumbs up? Yeah, yeah. What would happen if we did that? Would the world be different? Yeah. So, so is the will of God good and we're unable to follow it. Just a simple thing. In the world, is there enough food being created in the world to sustain every living human being right now? Yeah. Okay, so why do people die of hunger? Let me give you a profile shot. Just saying. It's us. And we haven't figured out how to feed the world. Is there enough stuff in the world so, so no one has to go homeless? Enough places for people to live so no one has to go homeless. So why are there people out on the street in Chicago? Is it the will of God? No, the will of God is that we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Wow. Maybe it's us. That's one answer. How about God's permissive will? Down at the bottom of the page. While God is omnipotent, all-powerful, he decided to limit the exercise of his power when he created angels and human beings. It is as if he said, I'm going to create things that can freely defy me and freely love me. For his own purposes, he allows things to happen which bring glory to him and blesses his people, even if it is through pain. And think about that, the, the man born blind. But let me, let me give you a closer example. Um, my eldest, Emily. So when she was born, I said this to the congregation when we came out here, uh, the, the one in Philadelphia where she was born when we came out here, and I use this as an example. I was raising uh, a daughter, and then I ended up raising four daughters, and I kept on saying, I will raise godly daughters, you raise godly men, and don't you send a boy into their lives that's going to hurt them. Right? But as a father, you have a daughter, do you really, do you know in your heart of hearts as dads, that, that somebody's going to break your little girl's heart? Do you know that? So why don't you stop it? Do you know that somebody, Emily, when she was little, somebody, one of our neighbor girls, um, coveted her bicycle bell. And I have no, I don't remember how she got it, but they were playing in the park, and all of a sudden, Em's bicycle bell was gone. She thought she lost it, and then she saw it on this other little girl's bike and, and came home and said, why does this happen? Why do people take things? I said, I don't know, but let's go talk with her mom and dad and, and with her and, and figure this out. And finally, the, the, the girl confessed that, that's, yes, she did take it, and she was sorry, and we got forgiveness. But, but um, what would my daughter's life be back, would be like if she didn't go through that experience? Or the experience of, what, what if I, I came in and every test she took, I just said, I know that stuff, don't worry about it, Emma. I'm going to give you the answer. And I took all her tests for her. 
What if, what if she never experienced any of those things? Would she be mature as a human being? See, some of the stuff that we think about struggles in life, it is, it is the natural exist, experience of a fallen world. God did not design Hitler, and he did not design Pol Pot. But what he did is he sent people, righteous people, into the world to say, I will give up my life to empty those concentration camps. I will give up my life for the sake of freedom. Oh, they are experiencing what it is to be like Jesus, just like the Bible said. Huh. For his own purposes, things, God allows things to happen which will bring glory to him and bless his people, even if it's through pain. So on the third page, uh, here's point number one. God allows pain and suffering. Though God always appro- neither approves of sin and its consequences, pain and suffering, nor is he responsible for it. We are. It is there by his permission. His permissive his permissive will allows bad things to happen. He doesn't fix everything in the world at all times, but he uses it. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. You heard me say quite often when I go into the hospital rooms, I, I, I will say that exact scripture verse. All things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. This just stinks, and I'm so sorry you're going through it. But God's glory is going to be seen. God's glory will be seen. No, nowhere is evil, pain, and suffering forced on God against his will. It says in Ephesians 1, he makes everything work out according to his plan. All human suffering, point two, is the result of the fall. Our suffering is the direct result of sin, which brought in mortality, suffering, death, and brokenness into our world. It's the result of the fall. Every occurrence of suffering is not punishment for our personal sins. You know, um, That people die is not the punishment of God on us. For the Christian, it's the process by which we get to heaven, right? And there's no other way to get to heaven except through death. So when Scripture says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear nothing. How do you learn how to fear nothing but walking through the valley of the shadow of death? And you never get to you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint with head, my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You don't get to that except through that struggle, that struggle and fear. God allows pain to happen in the world for a good reason. Pain keeps us from doing things and, and hurting ourselves. For instance, uh, I, I just grabbed a teapot the other day. It was too hot for me to hold on to. What if I couldn't feel that? Right? Uh, I have, I, I, it, through, through an injury, believe it or not, I had an injury in my life. Uh, through my injury, uh, early on in my life, I have lost feeling in my right knee, the knee that I kneel on most often. I have no feeling in it, so the other the other. A week I was working on something and I knelt down on a screw and didn't know I knelt down on a screw. So I looked down and, and my knee's all bloody. I had no idea. God put pain in there so that we could feel these kinds of things and stop doing it. Well, n- now the problem of our broken world is pain has run amok. I, I can remember one of the many people. I, I go through our cemetery, and when I walk through our cemetery, I see all kinds of f- folks there that I'm not afraid of the cemetery. They're all my friends. These are all people I knew, most of them, or I know their kids. And, and I wonder, what, you know, I got a gazillion questions for God. How come this one? How come that one? You know, I think a little Ian who breathed four times in those four breaths, right? Because you were there. And the four breaths, we, we were there in the delivery room uh, with a friend, and, and I baptized that little baby while he was still alive. 
And, and, but why Ian? Why that? I think of George. George, he, he was a, a man who said to me when he had, they, they opened him up, they used to do exploratory surgery before they had all these imaging things. They opened him up, they found out he had too many tumors, he closed him up and said, George, there's nothing we can do. And George looked at me and said, Pastor, I, I just, please, can you just promise me it's not going to be painful, a painful death? I can't stand pain. Well, I don't know if there's a man who had more pain that I've ever experienced in my ministry than George. It was so bad that I just, my, my inside gut feeling was, if nobody's watching, I'll just put a pillow over his head and end this. I mean, that's the level. I, 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 such compassion, and we have compassion for one another. But, but in the end, George, who, who suffered more than any other human I've ever seen, in his last days said, Pastor, I want you to know, God saw me through all of this. And it's only with God's help that I made it. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. Christians, point number three, are going to suffer too. God has not chosen to spare his children from the consequences of living in a fallen world. You know, Jesus said, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. We are not meant for this world. And we have to remember that. This is not, how, how many of you are expecting to live eternally in heaven because of Jesus Christ? That's what we're heading for. And so we sing, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. Earth is a desert drear, heaven is my home. We sing that because we know that there is yet another place where we belong. And, and while that's happening, though, we have to figure that stuff's going to happen in our world. Even St. Paul, remember, you know, St. Paul, this holy man of God, he's, he had a, a thorn in his flesh, he said. We don't know what it was. But he prayed mightily to God for, for three times, he says. And when St. Paul prays, it's big stuff. But God said, I'm not going to heal you of that. My grace is sufficient for you. And as followers of Jesus, one of the things that God does is he, he gives us his all-sufficient grace. Because we know, point number four, whatever calamity befalls us, God is always on our side. Read it with me. Eight, uh, Romans 8. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Now, on the back page, I gave you uh, a, a way of thinking about things. We're not going to get through it all. Uh, we would be here for hours. Th this, this is a five-hour sermon that we're compressing because it's a big issue. It's a big issue for all of us. We, we, we are broken, and we've experienced broken things. We've all experienced pain and disappointment. And so our plan of action it has to be this. One, we live in a fallen world, expect suffering. First Peter tells us that. We're going to live in a world among unbelievers and in a fallen world. We have to realize that God is in control. Nothing can happen unless he allows us, and we need to be humble before him. Remember how much Job suffered? Well, in Job 40, he finally says, listen, God, you be God. I'm going to cover my mouth I think I've said too much already. I'm just going to humbly wait for you to respond. Or how about Jeremiah 29? I have plans for you for good to give you a hope and a future. Or what about Isaiah 45? Why have I called you to this work? In good to, I send good times and bad times. Why speak as if clay argued with the potter or a newborn with its parents? It, you know, if, if a baby comes out of the womb and says, how come you didn't make it? I want to be a basketball player. How come you only made me five foot four? inches tall, as if someone can, can argue back and forth, that what we do is, is, is we experience God's grace and we see that he is sufficient. Understand, point number three, that suffering is a product of the fall and sometimes the discipline of God or the sin of others or the consequences of our actions. That, that 
that there are times in my life where I have suffered because of things I did to me, decisions that I made and struggles that I created. Sometimes it's that, like David and Bathsheba, that's 2 Samuel, or the slaughter of the innocents, that was somebody else's sin. Do you remember that, that all the kids two years and younger from Bethlehem were killed after Jesus was born? Or, or what about Ananias and Sapphira who, who uh, held back their, their gifts from God and he said, you guys, I'm, I'm just going to punish you for what you did. Uh, point number four, accept the reality that God allows suffering for good and necessary reasons, like preparing us to comfort others. You know, I've, I was just with somebody last night who said, uh, you know, I need to talk with you. And part of this is you've been through this challenge. And that's, that's a part of the reason. I, and you've come out the other side, and I want to have the same kind of, of hope. It says in 2 Corinthians, he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. You know, I can talk about the struggles of a tumor that would kill you or recovering from serious surgery, or dealing with divorce, or having been an abused person, where I can talk about I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, I got hit by lightning. You know, it, it, is, it is all these things that, that God gives us a, an opportunity to comfort one another because we've experienced them, and we can tell the next generation who doesn't have our experience and say, I have been through this too, and this is how God has brought me along, and he can bring you along too. To teach us to trust him and not ourselves, to turn our hearts towards heaven, to develop maturity. Remember in Romans 5, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops character, and character gives us hope, and, and hope is salvation, and hope will not lead to disappointment. The pathway to get to hope is having gone through all kinds of struggles and problems in life. Sometimes it's disciplining us for s- sinful behavior. Sometimes it's to judge wickedness, that God does do that. Sometimes it, it's to test us so that we know the strength of our faith. Uh, you know, as, as I said with St. Paul talking about the thorn in his flesh, in the end, God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And he had to learn that. How about this one, uh, point five? Remember that God has entered into our suffering to redeem us from, us, from it. That, that, that the suffering that we experience in life is nothing other than what God himself has experienced. Or point six, remember that we don't see yet clearly. That, that sometimes we think like children. It says in, in 1 Corinthians 13, we act like children. We think like children. But, but now we, we put that away. We still see through a glass dimly. But there comes a day when we're going to see face to face. It's just not yet. And finally, uh, the last point, seven, remember that this life is nothing when compared to eternity. Um, it says in Romans 8, 18 through 28, what we suffer now is, never, is not to be compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good to them love God or are called according to his purpose. In the end, friends, I, I know all of us have got, got questions like, Pastor, can you explain why this happened to me? Why am I widowed? Why did I get cancer? Why, why was, was my... Why did my parents, why were they taken away from me so early? How come my marriage ended? Why did this happen? Why, why has injustice happened to me? And we, we've got all of these questions. We may not be able to give the exact answer, but I can tell you this is an answer. God has not forsaken or left you and he never will. And when you start off with that, you can start making sense of why things happen. And when you look back in life, you can see either in this world and see God's hand carrying you Or you can see it from heaven when it will become abundantly clear why. 
So let's pray. Oh, Lord God, I don't understand why there is evil in life, why there is pain and suffering. But today, I just want to thank you that you did something about it. And you provided me, Jesus. And there is yet a place in heaven where there is no more suffering or pain or sorrow or tears. But there is forever joy with you. And I look forward to that day. Now from, uh, until then, O oh Lord, help me be someone who seeks justice and love. And doing your will, help me be comfort to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.